Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's 40 Days Live event. This uh, gathering is called A History of Violence, The Legacy of Environmental Racism in Canada and features Dr. Ingrid Waldron. We are glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Adele Halliday. I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church. And uh, I'm one of a team of people who are coordinating um, the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. Uh, there are lots more activities that are happening besides live events. Uh, this is, of course, being recorded. That can be shared afterwards. Uh, there are weekly, um, there's a writing, there's a writer series. These are this week's featured writers. Um, there's the live events. There's a series of write events. The, the past ones are posted online. And as well, this week has a featured book uh, written by our presenter today called There's Something in the Water. So that will be a great book to pick up to accompany this uh, this talk today. And it's available from the United Church Bookstore. Uh, there's a discount of 20% um, off orders of two or more books with a discount code 40 days. As well, since this evening has a creation focus, I uh, just wanted to highlight some other United Church initiatives around creation. One is an ecumenical initiative called For the Love of Creation, and there's some information here. There's also some um, upcoming events that people can register, and I know one of my staff colleagues is going to put a link in the chat uh, where you can find a little bit more, um, but this is generally about the COP, COP28 that's coming up, the Conference of Parties focused on uh, climate change and broader initiatives around um, climate justice as well as um, uh, ecological justice. So link is coming in the chat and offers more ways of engaging this topic in other ways. So uh, we're glad you're here for the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, again, there'll be more links coming in the chat and uh, we look forward to continuing to gather together. So with that, uh, I would love to turn the rest of the evening over to Dr. Ingrid Walden, um, who is, has much wisdom to share around environmental racism. So thank you and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. All right. I'm hoping everyone can see that. If you can't, uh, please uh, let us know. So as uh, Adele mentioned, I'm going to talk about the legacy of environmental racism in Canada using um, my project as a guide, a project I've been doing through my organization called the Enriched Project since uh, 2012. And the year after I started the project, uh, because I knew it was going to be a community-based project, I decided to go down with my team uh, to meet community members so they can provide us with guidance on what we should be looking for, which is typically not what uh, academics do. We just kind of start the project. We don't ask any questions, but I wanted this to be truly community engaged. And I thought that if I were going to come up with research questions and objectives, then the community members themselves should tell me what those should be. So the purpose of uh, those workshops or those small meetings in the communities was about you know, you know, using a kind of very open, a non-standardized uh, interview guide or focus group guide, um, but to use it in a way that would allow them to share their concerns and how they thought we should tackle uh, this particular issue. Uh, so during one of those workshops, specifically in the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville, um, I got this really, I thought, interesting quote uh, from a resident about the impacts of the first and second generation landfill on the community. So I like to sometimes begin with this quote because I think environmental racism is a obviously a health issue. And this quote speaks to a lot of the health issues that many of the communities I've worked with have shared. So this resident says, if you look at the health of the community prior to 1974, before the landfill site was located in our community, our community seemed to be healthier. From 1974 on until the present day, we notice our people's health seems to be going downhill. Our people seem to be passing on at a younger age. They are contracting different types of cancer that we've never heard of prior to 1974. Our stomach cancer seems to be on the rise. Diabetes is on the rise. Our people 
end up with tumors in their body and we're at a loss of, you know, of what's causing it. The municipality says that there's no way that the landfill site is affecting us. But if the landfill site uh, located in other areas is having an impact on people's health, then shouldn't the landfill site located next to our community be having an impact on our health too? Here's James Desmond from that same community. James Desmond uh, is a longtime environmental activist. Unfortunately, uh, I was told early this year that he passed away in April of this year, but he, I would say, is the very first person I met when I started my project on environmental racism, a real um, strong, resourceful person who's been trying to address the landfill in his communi community since 1974. I'd like to, I always like to show this uh, definition of environmental racism from uh, James because I think it's simple, it's easy to understand, yet still layered and still has all of the components of the more academic definition of environmental racism, which I'll show you later. So James says here, um, uh, so I should also mention that uh, this was captured on video. So during those series of workshops we held in communities, um, we produced a video called um, In Whose Backyard that you could find on my, on my Enrich website or you could find on YouTube. So this is what he said that we filmed uh, during the workshops. He says the practice has been locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. And what he's saying here is that it's disproportionately impacting racialized communities or non-white communities and also low-income communities. So if they are white communities, they tend to be low-income communities. And I can think of one white community in Nova Scotia, uh, specifically in Harriet's field, that has been contending with uh, contaminated water since the 1980s. So keeping in mind that they are low income and they are also rural. And those are two kind of components that are sometimes essential when we talk about environmental racism. So it's about certainly mostly racialized and indigenous communities being impacted by this. Uh, but if white communities are also impacted, they're certainly not affluent white communities. There are communities that have low socioeconomic status. And similar to many of the black and indigenous communities, they are also white communities that live in rural or isolated places. So that's another part of the equation. You know, race is part of the equa equation, uh, income, social class or socioeconomic status, but also where you live, geography. Uh, so these industries are typically put in those out of the way places uh, where people are often ignored. Um, government tends to ignore uh, these residents because they're far away and they know that if they put it in, for example, an affluent uh, community that's much more visible, there will be fight back, right? And that's not to say that these communities don't fight back, but they're certainly not heard and they're often invisibilized in many ways. Uh, so I love to use that definition um, from James, but I also want to point you to the more academic definition uh, from Dr. Robert Bullard, Dr. Robert Bullard is um, an academic, a professor teaching in Texas currently. He's an African American scholar who did not coin the term uh, environmental racism. It was coined by um, Dr. Dr. or Dr. and Reverend Benjamin Chavez in the early to mid 1980s. But Dr. Bullard has done probably the most work on this particular issue. Uh, and he's considered, as I said, the father of environmental justice. Since he started the work on environmental racism, he has done great work in intersecting it with other issues like climate change, food security, transit, et cetera. Something, he's, like a, he's like a mentor to me in a way, uh, because this is what I'm also beginning to do is to show those intersections uh, with other um, priority issues in communities. So this is his definition, and it always begins with, I think, the most important aspect of that de definition, which is about, as James Desmond in the picture before said, is about disproportionality. Who is most impacted? Um, well, the, the siting of dangerous, hazardous industries um, are typically, they're, they're typically in racialized communities, low-income communities, out-of-the-way communities. So this first definition of 
the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous and racialized communities to these hazardous industries is perhaps the main definition of environmental racism. And if I were in a rush and somebody asked me how, how to define it, this is, this is the tenet of environmental racism that I would offer them. Um, but it's also about uh, certainly um, several other uh, issues, such as the lack of political power that the, these communities have for addressing the issues. So these communities do fight back. They have a voice. As I said, they're often not heard. We have to ask ourselves why they're not heard. It's often because they don't have social, economic, and political power. So they're, as I said earlier, invisibilized in many ways or ignored. The other aspect of environmental racism is the implementation of policies that sanction the harmful and in many cases, life-threatening uh, presence of poisons in these communities. The implementation of policy, specifically environmental policy. So when we think of racism or disadvantage in any way, we often think of the policies. It's often structural. It doesn't just happen. Whether we talk about the underachievement of certain racialized communities in the education system or problems accessing healthcare or discrimination in the immigration system or with respect to public infrastructure and the built environment uh, like housing and transit. Uh, these are structural issues that start with policy. So we have to look at uh, departments of environment across Canada and look at who's creating policies and the kind of policies they're creating. The people who are creating these environmental policies don't look like me. They're probably not indigenous. Uh, they come from communities that are not necessarily traditionally impacted by environmental racism. Uh, so I often say that when they make policies, uh, racial racism is often inscribed within these policies in very, very subtle ways, sometimes unknowingly, because I think, I think at the heart of this is about who do you think is worthy and has value and who do you think does not have value or worth Right, so the first thing people go to is, well, I don't want it to be in my community. And a student stood up and told me that actually when I did a presentation at Dalhousie a few years ago, she stood up and I talked about Lincolnville. And she said, well, Dr. Waldron, I, I ask you, when, where do you want the landfill in Lincolnville to go then? In our community was her question, right? So that's a really great example of, you know, I wanna protect my community from this it needs to go elsewhere. And it ends up, of course, in, in communities that are seen as not having worth or value, and that's racialized uh, communities. It's also about um, the disproportionate negative impacts of environmental policies and the differential rates of cleanup. So in this case, you have to ask, why does it take so long or why did it take so long for uh, Peak 2 Landing First Nation uh, in Nova Scotia to get cleanup? And why is the cleanup happening more quickly in other communities. So the kind of hesitance or slow rate of cleanup and the decades to, to get cleanup is another sign of environmental racism. When you have a community like P2 Landing First Nation, I'll talk about it later, who, um, you know, where they saw effluent being dumped into Boat Harbor since 1967 and cleanup only happened in 2020, then you've got to ask some questions, right? Despite the fact that the community has been advocating on their own behalf since, uh, I guess forcefully, since the 1980s, but certainly before that. Um, it's also about, I would say, uh, an issue that people don't often think about, which is the exclusion of the impacted communities from decision-making. Uh, we often hear that term, having a seat at the table. Ironically, the communities that are most impacted, racialized communities, Black communities in Nova Scotia, Indigenous communities across Canada, do not have a seat at the table. So they're often not involved in environmental policymaking, decision making that's concerned with their own community. They're not invited to the table. Um, so environmental racism then manifests over time, manifests intergenerationally. I think one reason being um, the fact that we don't we don't get to hear the perspectives from the people who are impacted. We don't they don't get to share their suggestions and recommendations uh, about how this should be addressed. Um, their ways of knowing, uh, their experiences do not get written into policies or environmental assessments. An environmental assessment is a tool that's used to decide where 
a particular project which could be hazardous goes. And there's an indigenous philosophy, for example, there's an indigenous epistemology that is premised on holism. And their ways of knowing don't get captured into an environmental assessment, which is still done in a very Euro-Western way. So I think one of the reasons environmental racism manifests over time is because we're not capturing uh, those voices. So I want to um, kind of give you a, first, a few case studies of environmental racism up, across Canada, starting with uh, some of the communities I worked with in Nova Scotia, because that's where it all began uh, for me. Uh, the community you see here um, is a community I have much admiration for because they have been persistent and consistent. Uh, and they were persistent and consistent for seven years. A uh, company was coming into their community to build a brine discharge pipeline. Uh, and this community is called Sabag and Nagady First Nation. And between 2014 and 2021, that brine discharge pipeline project was planned. But over the years, they have done so many different things to halt uh, that project. And that project ended. And I'll talk about that later. Um, but they, of course, had major concern to concerns about the danger of having a brine discharge pipeline um, in their community uh, put in the Sabaganagany River. Um, and they were concerned about fish. They were concerned about it, its impacts on climate change. And they just simply didn't want something like that that seemed very dangerous in their community. And there are studies in the United States that indicate that brine discharge pipelines are very, very dangerous. However, uh, Alta Gas, which was planning to put this brine discharge pipeline in the community, uh, saw otherwise, didn't see any hazards uh, to going ahead with this project. Yeah, we have, I talked briefly earlier about P2 Landing First Nation. This is Boat Harbor. Uh, Boat Harbor was a pristine hunting and fishing ground until 1967 when a pulp mill came into the community and started dump dumping uh, wastewater into Boat Harbor. So it became this cocktail of toxins. And in the meantime, you know, people got sick. Uh, people often talk about high rates of cancer and respiratory illness, uh, and they feel that that is linked uh, to this very toxic site. Um, so this, this started in 1967, and as I said earlier, ended uh, in 2020, and I will talk about why that is the case a little later. Many of you may know about Amjan Wong First Nation near Sarnia, Ontario. It's often referred to as Chemical Valley, and this to me is a really stunning case of environmental racism. I would say that Peak Two Landing First Nation and Boat Harbor, which I just talked about, is one of the worst case, uh, one, one of the worst cases of environmental racism, although it's no longer really a case because it, it was addressed. I would say that Amjan Wong First Nation is probably the worst case. This is a community that's actually surrounded by, believe it or not, over 60 petrochemical facilities this is surrounding this community. If you ask me, it sounds like somebody's trying to kill the community to surround them with so many uh, facilities. And like many of the communities that I've talked about, they have major concerns about their health. They've got reproductive illnesses and high rates. They've got reproductive cancers, respiratory illness, all of which they believe is linked uh, to living near to these over 60 petrochemical uh, facilities. You may also know about Kenora, Ontario um, and Grassy Narrows First Nation. So starting in, I guess, 1960s and also in the ninth, continuing into the 1970s, Mercury was dumped in the Wabagoon English River. Um, and there was an article that came out, I think either last year, April, the year before, about the health issues that community members are dealing with, despite the fact that this happened decades ago. You know, so I find that the health impacts of dangerous industry is often undermined by government. They will say there are no health impacts. You can't prove it. You can never prove it. Um, but many of the community members uh, who are connected to this particular site uh, were interviewed, I, I, I think it was last year, it's on CBC, about neurological issues that they uh, continue to experience, different symptoms, neurological problems ranging from numbness in the fingers and toes to seizures. 
that they are contending with right now, um, even though once again, this happened decades ago. You probably heard a lot about Wet'suwet'en First Nation. I think Wet'suwet'en probably gets probably more attention than ma many other communities right now because it's happening right now. And this is a community that has been trying to fight off the implementation of a multi-billion dollar pipeline in their community. And there have been sit-ins, blockades, different kind of activist um, activities across Canada to support uh, this community. Um, and um, I've got to get an update of what's been happening, but I know there was an RCMP or police. There was an incident that happened probably a year ago. Um, but like many of the other communities that I've mentioned, this is a community that's been resisting for a long time. So I think I think it's been about seven years now uh, that this community has been actively resisting uh, the implementation of this uh, multi-billion dollar pipeline project. When we think of environmental racism, we often think of indigenous communities because of how closely they are connected to the land. And because the fact is across Canada, uh, they are most impacted than any other community with respect to environmental racism. But there are Black communities that are also impacted. And I don't know, for some reason, they seem to be in Nova Scotia. I, I can't answer why, I can't say why, but I also think it's because of that other element in Nova Scotia with Black communities. Unlike, and I should say Nova Scotia, Halifax, et cetera. Unlike, um, I would say maybe Quebec and Ontario or Toronto, Montreal, you've got a lot of um, historic rural black communities. That's not to say that there aren't rural communities in Ontario, but most 98% of the communities that are black in Nova Scotia live in rural out of the way places. Um, the only urban community I can think of is the North end of Halifax, which was gentrified. So the community was still pushed out. But um, when, as I said, you, you have that intersection of race, socioeconomic status, class and rurality, or being out of the way, living in an out of the way place, it's much easier to put an industry there because you think the community will be silent because nobody would notice, right? So with Africville that you see on the screen right here, this was a, I would say thriving African Nova Scotian community, not rich, not wealthy by any means, but a sense of solidarity and community and connectedness in this community. And then the city of Halifax decided to engage in industrial development in around in the 1950s. And they needed to get the community out. And they tried to get the community out in several ways. I, uh, I think the church was burnt down. I'm not sure if they found out who did that. Because uh, of course, you know, the church is extremely important to most black communities. And certainly when I lived in Nova Scotia, uh, religion church is extremely important to the community. Um, some residents were pushed out on dump trucks. I think I saw some photos of a kid on a dump truck. Um, they needed to get the residents out of there to make way for industrial de development. Some residents went to the North End. So the North End I just talked about is an urban community, but they went. They ended up there. But the North End has a lot of social housing. It's also very much stigmatized as a gun you know, kind of like a ghetto, I guess you would say in Nova Scotia. People will say to you, if you go there, oh, don't go to the North End. At least they would say that in the past. It's now been gentrified. Um, I would say that Africville is a community that has had to contend with both environmental racism and gentrification at the same time. Um, so I always cite it as an example of both. Uh, why is it uh, an example of environmental racism. I already talked about the fact that they were pushed out because it was being gentrified, but in the wake of that gentrification, uh, there were various social and environmental hazards that were left in the community. And that included a fertilizer plant, a slaughterhouse, a tar factory, a stone and coal crushing plant, a cotton factory, a prison, three systems of railway tracks and an open dump. So those are the environmental hazards that were left in the wake of industrial development. We've got Lincolnville. So you saw the photo of James Desmond earlier. This is his community. Um, 1974, a first generation landfill was put in the community. And over that time and until I guess 2006, but even later, the community was advocating for themselves to get that landfill redirected, to put it someplace else. They didn't want it in their community. Uh, a real slap in the face when in 2006, the municipality put a second generation landfill over the first generation landfill when the community thought they were making some inroads. 
Um, I started the project, as I said, in 2013. I went down to Lincolnville and other communities. I met with James, as I said, and he handed me a letter that he had sent several times to the municipality only to be ignored. The, the, net, the letter was never responded to. So yes, they were advocating between 1974 and 2006, but when I went there in 2013, still advocating. And this is an elderly population. And I do believe that probably more than most of the communities I work with, they just got burnt out. I mean, there were times where I was calling on them. What do, would you like me to do? Let's follow up, let's do this. And I just never really heard from them again. Um, so this is, this is an issue that will not be addressed. I, uh, this is just too late. This landfill will not be redirected. Um, as I said, James passed away and and I think the community and elderly community is burnt out and tired as they should be. And there are a few things that we did do despite the fact that this will not be redirected. We did do water testing for them in 2016, which I'll talk about. So at least we were able to do something for the community to let them know what's in their water, all the contaminants, they never had any idea and help them to manage their drinking water supply. Here's Shelburne. If you saw my documentary on Netflix or Apple or Microsoft, Xbox or Prime Video, you would have been um, you have been enthralled by Louise DeLille because she's such a wonderful person. Um, I met her in 2015 and she told me in 2015 when I met her, when I was hiring her to do some focus groups about environmental racism and its health impacts in her community, um, she told me about this dump that has been there since 1942. She said everything and anything went in there, uh, syringes from the hospital, uh, animals, um, all kinds of things that should not have been in there. People were just dumping it in there. And she also talked about the high rates of cancer and particularly multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. And I was really shocked when she said, most people in my community have cancer. Uh, she said 95% of us. And there was a certain point in time when, you know, we were, were friends now, of course, and she we had, were Facebook friends and were regular friends. And she would send me a Facebook message like every week telling me about this person who had died and this person who had died. And I thought, wow, um, the emotional and psychological toll that that would take on a community, maybe feeling that you're waiting to die. I, I don't know, but all your friends in this small community are dying every week. Um, that's something that's often missed when we do work on environmental racism, which is the PTSD or the psychological impacts of uh, environmental racism, which you know I, I brought together the community in 2021 just to talk about the psychological impacts, because I thought if a community is dealing with somebody dying, somebody that they know in such a small community every week, that has to do something. Um, so yeah, it's been shocking to me that so many people have cancer and uh, that they have a rare cancer like multiple uh, myeloma. But Louise, a strong leader, has done so many things in the community since I met her in 2015. Uh, it's, it's really stunning what she's done to close the landfill and to help her community in other ways. Toronto also has some issues. Um, now that I'm back in Toronto, now that I'm back in Ontario after 13 years, in Nova Scotia, I'm still trying to find people to speak with to talk about uh, other you know, environmental issues in Toronto and Montreal and other areas. Um, but I wanna talk about the greater Toronto area uh, and pollution is typically concentrated in highly racialized and immigrant communities. I'm sure you're aware of that, uh, particularly in places like Scarborough and Etobicoke North. And there's one example, the notorious case of the McClure radioactive site in Scarborough led a group of immigrant citizens who had been given radioactive land without warning into a decades long legal battle with the Ontario government and they eventually won. Um, and that court case, that, that uh, legal battle is documented in a book by Heitenting from 2016. And I should say also, you know, where I teach Hamilton is known for air pollution and Hamilton, you know, the area is very racialized and immigrant, right? So we can't forget Hamilton. When I was writing my book and I wanted to write a book about my journey, I was asked to write the book. I, I have to be honest, I didn't want to write the book, but the publisher Fernwood uh, had coffee with me in 2015 around Easter time. And he said, I want you to write a book. And I said, I'm not ready to write a book. I want to write some journal articles. You know, a book is just too much right now. But he convinced me. 
And as I thought about the book, I thought, what what theory should I be using for this? Um, I was attending a lot of talks at that time and people were talking about standing up and talking about this settler colonialism. And I really didn't know much about it, but it seemed to be the 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 kind of theory everyone was talking about activists scholars and I thought and I read more into it and I thought this is perfect settler colonial theory really allows me to articulate um how environmental racism plays out um so I did decide on a settler colonial framework and in making a distinction between settler colonialism and colonialism as we know with colonialism you've got the European colonizers coming to the new world but and for exploitation of course of resources but returning home they return home uh to europe with settler colonialism they come for the same reason exploitation of resources and in indigenous communities but they stay they make the the new world their home um, when i think of environmental racism and i see it through the lens of settler colonialism that's what i see happening you've got the industry owners and government much of this for profit of course uh engaged in the exploitation of indigenous land and the genocide of indigenous people uh for profit um and it certainly has many other tenets to settler colonialism but i thought when I was writing the book and I was using settler colonialism to talk about what was happening with environmental racism and how it was impacting communities, everything just flowed really well. It just really made sense as a theory uh, that should be used to discuss uh, environmental racism. But it's also important to talk about racial capitalism because I think when people talk about capitalism, they often leave the race part out. And in reading about racial capitalism, um, you know, people often argue that you can never leave racism out of capitalism because um, the bodies that tend to be exploited are racialized people through uh, capitalism. Um, so capitalism certainly too is connected to settler colonialism. It's a key feature of settler colonialism. As I said, uh, there's exploitation of resources for profit for industry owners and government, but environmental, sorry, racial capitalism needs to be hinged or linked uh, to settler colonialism. So, you know, when I discuss these two issues in my book, they were not disjointed issues. I, I, I framed it around settler colonialism, but then I found a space to then talk about racial capitalism. Um, and environmental racism certainly is an example of that. So with racial capitalism, it's whose bodies are being exploited. Um, racial capitalism would say, certainly indigenous racialized bodies, but it also talks a little bit about women, right? People that are often exploited and used for capital. So whenever we talk once again about capitalism, you cannot disconnect it from the racialized uh, component. There's an interdependence of capitalism and racism that must always uh, be articulated um, according to um, uh, racial capitalism and that's the through the reproduction of colonization of racial difference right and from wealth and profit and wealth so we have to see that racial difference we have to see the differences in people we have to articulate or understand how we value and don't value certain people and then we need to identify those people who tend to be oppressed or exploited uh, for profit one of the things I talked about in my book is um, environmental blackmail. I don't know if you've heard of the term environmental blackmail, but a really good example of that is in Lincolnville. Lincolnville folks, the African Nova Scotians, certainly want the landfill removed. They want it redirected. They talk often about the health effects. However, they also lament the fact that there were no jobs that came to them from the landfill, right? So they were promised jobs from the landfill that never happened. An outsider would say to them then, an outsider would say, well, I thought you had concerns about the landfill. I thought you're concerned about the health effects of the landfill. And now you're saying that you want jobs from the landfill. That's a perfect example of environmental blackmail because when you come into a very, very poor, low income community, of course they have to make a compromise, right? There are jobs. Uh, there are jobs at a landfill that is actually harming their health, yes. But it's only when you're poor or low income that you have to make that decision. Uh, so it's not duplicitous. Um, it's not inauthentic. It's just what racialized low income communities have to contend with, a job or perhaps an impact on my health that's very negative. So I saw that playing out in Lincolnville when they were lamenting all the health problems and the high cancer rates that have increased over the years. But at the same time, James Desmond said, 
we were waiting for jobs and those jobs never panned out. So it's a very good kind of example of, I think, um, of racial capitalism, the exploitation of low income communities that are often uh, racialized. So I wanna talk now about the Enrich Project and what I've been trying to do uh, since 2012. Um, I was approached by an activist to do this work on environmental racism, very hesitant on my part. I never did any work on the environment, wasn't necessarily interested in environmental issues. Uh, the only thing that attracted me to this would be an opportunity to work with uh, Indigenous and Black communities. I was in Nova Scotia, still slightly new in Nova Scotia, was making inroads in those communities, but not enough. And I wanted to make more inroads. And I thought to myself, this would be an opportunity to meet with those communities. It would also be an opportunity to look at health. I saw immediately, even though the health aspects of this is often not articulated by government and other people, people tend to work in silos, I think. You've got your environmental scientists who are focused on pollution and often don't talk about health at all. And you've got the health people. You know, It was very difficult for me in Nova Scotia to get the people from um, Nova Scotia Health and and the Department of Health and Wellness to even engage with this topic of environment. So everybody's in their corner. And I know you knew immediately as a health researcher that obviously this is a health issue. When people think of some kind of hazardous industry in their community, like a landfill, I think people immediately go to cancer. I might get cancer. At least that's what I would think. So that intrigued me. And I eventually said, yeah, I'll do it. And I think one of the reasons I said yes is also because I was, I was fearful of this topic. I didn't know anything. I was also worried that somebody would call me out. They would say, why is Ingrid doing this? She's not an environmental scientist. This is not her field. All of that scared me, but it also intrigued me. It was an opportunity to learn something new. Um, I knew that it had to be a project that was community-based or community-engaged. It had to be led by the community. I wanted it to be multi-method. I wanted it to be have a multiple approach to the issue. I wanted it to be intersectional. I wanted to be partnered with a multidisciplinary team and all of that uh, certainly came to be as I moved along. One of the things I, ne I needed to do first was create awareness because when I started the project, there was so much doubt. I remember a comment, you know, when people used to be able to leave comments uh, at the end of the online newspapers, this was the Chronicle Herald, uh, the main newspaper in Nova Scotia at the time. And in the comments below, somebody said, um, is Dr. Waldron serious? Environmental racism, really? She's serious? Um, what's next, environmental sexism? So it was a kind of a laughing thing. You know, this, this is just something Dr. Waldron is coining. She wants to create something else about racism that's not real. And, and um, that was pretty harsh, but I actually, I actually laughed because I think it's actually funny. <laughs> Very funny, that comment. But I got a lot of quizzical looks in the beginning from journalists and other people like, what is environmental racism? I've never heard of it. So I said to myself, the way to empathy um, is awareness raising. People have to know about an issue. And then when they know about the issue, they will act on the issue. And I saw that play out in this project since I've been doing it you know, since 2012, that once people learn a little bit more about it, they read about it, they learn that it's a systemic issue as I did, it's about environmental policy, then that makes more sense. If the policy part wasn't part of it, then they wouldn't understand it because then they would say, well, I don't understand how the environment, the water is racist. Is that what you're saying? The water is racist, <laughs> right? Which is one of the reasons I didn't take it on in the beginning because I thought, what a stupid term. And then I realized it was about systemic issues and policy, right? So I did a lot of awareness raising in Nova Scotia. I'm burnt out right now, so I don't do it as much anymore. But I was always holding a workshop, a talk, a symposium. It, it felt like every single month. That's how it felt. This is my favorite that you see on the screen from 2015. We had just built a new beautiful library, library in Halifax. And I said to myself, when that library was built, I said, I just want to hold an event there because the library is so beautiful. Um, but this was my favorite event because, you know, it was educational, informative, all of that. But you know, we also had, it was inspirational. We had drummers, we had, and I love drums. So we had an African drum group. We had an all female uh, Mi'kmaq indigenous drum group. Um, and after the, after the event, I got a lot of volunteers, which typically always happened. You know, it's like if I'm struggling because I don't have a grant right now, I was always able to kind of rely on volunteers. 
And that's one of the things that my events did. People would sit in the audience, come to me later, or phone me up and say, never heard of this, but I was really inspired last night and I want to know how can I help you? That always happened. Uh, so events are great to put on. It's great. It's informative. But when you inspire people and then they learn about it, they're not laughing at you anymore. And they say, Dr. Waldron, I'd like to help. What can I do? That's just music uh, to my ears. Um, uh, multimedia has also played an important part. And this is something that I recognize is needed because people want to receive information in different ways. Not everybody wants to read my book. They don't want to read journal articles. They want to re receive information in ways that are meaningful to them. Uh, so I've tried to be creative in how I share knowledge. This map, which is just a flat map, that's what you're seeing, something flat. But if you go onto my website, I just recently had this map upgraded by an organization or an, an organization in Toronto called um, AROUP, A-R-U-P. And they do a lot of great digital work using GIS analysis. Um, but essentially what this map shows is the location of various waste sites in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities across Nova Scotia. So of course, as I said early on, there were a lot of doubters. Um, once this map was created, um, those doubters, some of them came back to me on email and said to me, oh, I can see it now. This makes sense. And the map was actually published in Canadian Geographic and CBC Online. Um, I was told later by somebody who does GIS analysis, he was like, of course, Dr. Waldron, when you put stuff on a map, people believe it. He said, you have your data and you've got your research. Yes, that's great. But when you use GIS analysis and you are able to visualize uh, information on a map, it's very convincing to people. And, and I didn't realize that. I certainly know that now. So this map shows the location of incinerators, uh, landfills, uh, waste dumps, uh, pipelines, uh, specifically in specific communities, Mi'kmaq communities, specific African Nova Scotian communities. When you hone in onto the dots that you see there, you will see which communities. My research assistant also uh, looked at the health risks of each of those sites, right, using the EPA website. So to say that a particular material in a particular dump uh, could cause, for example, um, kidney disease, autism, very specific illnesses. I guess for those who don't believe there's a link between hazardous sites and, and health. So I think that's that was really also very useful to show those possible health risks connected to uh, each of those sites. One of the most exciting things I've been engaged in is, is movie making with a movie star. Um, Canadian or Nova Scotia born actor Elliot Page, this just came out of the blue, um, still makes no sense to me how it happened, but it was it was the fall of 2018. I was on my enriched Twitter page, just you know browsing and I noticed a new follower, didn't think anything of it. We always have new followers. It was very obscure. Uh, it did say Elliot's name, but you know, he was wearing a, like a chapeau, uh, sepia colored. The photo seemed very sepia colored. It seemed very obscured. It didn't look like a movie star. I didn't think anything of it. So I just went about my business. And then four weeks later, I came back and I, and I noticed my Twitter page was active. And I have to say that I wasn't that active on that Twitter page. And it, somebody was promoting my book and, and the Enrich Project and supporting uh, the women on the front lines. And I'm like, this, this is weird. Why, why is my page so active? And I noticed it was the same person I had noticed four weeks ago. And I said, is this Elliot Page, the actor who I saw in the movie Juno and Inception and X-Men? And I said, well, why would he be reaching out to me? I had no idea he was any kind of activist or would be interested in this. Turns out, I don't want to get too much into it because it's going to be too long. Turns out <clears throat> he read another book um, called uh, The Mill about the peak to landing mill by the journalist, I wish I remember her name, uh, Joan Baxter. And that book led led him to my book and he really loved the, the, my book and he wanted to support it. So a lot of it was uh, on Twitter, read Ingrid Waldron's book, this is fascinating. And I said, I can't just leave that be. This is, you know, somebody promoting my book. I need to, I need to thank him. And I DM'd him and I said, thank you very much for all you're doing. And he said, I wanna find a way to use my platform, my celebrity to help this cause. I'm from Nova Scotia. I'm actually near, my family is near to Shelburne, actually. 
and I want to do something. Um, he was friends with a, a restaurant owner. I forgot her name right now. Uh, it's a restaurant called The Wooden Monkey, uh, two, two branches in, in Nova Scotia. And she said to me, I think I'd spoken to her about El Elliot reaching out to me because we were on a committee together. And she said, do you want me to set up a call with you and Elliot Page? And I said, yes, definitely. I've known Elliot for 15 years. I can certainly set up that call. And I said, yeah, that would be great. End of 2018, it happened, three-way call. And we were just kind of banding about some ideas. What could we do? And we actually came up with the idea of just like a 10-minute video that we would post on Twitter to create awareness. That's the stage I was at. You know, I just need to create awareness. I need to create empathy. It's only when I went to Elliot's mother's home and they showed me, Elliot and the co-director showed me the full film, I realized how impactful and emotional it was. And I thought slapping it onto Twitter is not going to do it justice. And I said, because I love documentaries, I said, I think we need a full length documentary. And the co-director said, are you talking about 70 minutes? I said something like that. And we also need to show it at TIFF the most important uh, film festival in the world in Toronto. And we need to send, we need to send it to Robert Redford's film festival. I mean, I was, I was going on and on. Um, and we did, and we rushed to the deadline for TIFF. It got in and um, it premiered on September 9th, uh, 2019. Um, this is, a, this is an academic's dream. I think maybe not every academic, but certainly mine is that you have a book. My very first book, the film is based on, the book, the documentary. My very first book, um, there's a documentary based on it. And then when you premiere your documentary, the celebrity has had his publicist line up a whole bunch of interviews with Time Magazine, Los Angeles Times, Entertainment Weekly, Entertainment Canada, a whole host of media that this day, when we premiered the film, this very day, we were rushing around to different media outlets to give interviews about environmental racism. I mean, I this is a gift. I, as an academic, this is what I want. This is what we call knowledge mobilization, but this is knowledge mobilization in the highest form. Um, and all that happened from one book. So this today, to this day, I don't know why it happened and how it happened, and it's a blur, um, but it certainly... It's certainly one of the most um, one of the most important, I guess, experiences. I hate to sound dramatic of my life, of my career, that this happened. Makes no sense. Um, then we heard Netflix, and I thought, I can't believe this. And I kind of knew this was going to happen in October, like a month after it premiered at TIFF. I heard that it could possibly happen, but we weren't sure. And then we found out, yes, Netflix was happy to. Uh, start streaming it uh, March, end of March, 2020. This was just like a week after COVID hit. Um, it's no longer on Netflix, I have to say. We had a two-year or three-year contract. And the reason why is because I'm not sure to this day, really. Maybe I need to ask uh, the co-director. Um, it's not the typical documentary that Netflix screens. That's what I think they told us. It's not the typical. So they took it for two years. Um, but... Even at that time when it was on Netflix, it was already on Apple TV, Microsoft, Xbox, and um, Prime Video. And then you can also purchase it uh, for educational institutions. It's at McMaster uh, Library. It's also at Dalhousie and I think St. FX as well and others across um, Canada and probably the United States. So this has been really thrilling and exciting because of the, the global reach and the response that I got, people emailing me from Europe everywhere saying, um, I'm shocked by this. I thought Canada was different. Or people from Nova Scotia saying, I didn't know this was happening in P2 Landing First Nation. And I live right there. You know, how once again, how can I help was the question, which is the music to my ears, right? So it's, it's garnered a public, uh, an audience globally. But then when people say to me, I'm shocked by this. They empathize with it. And then they ask me how I can help. That's the power of media. And that's that's been the gift. Um, I said I like to be creative. Well, Halifax has an annual Art at Night Festival. I know Toronto has one too. It's called Nocturne. And they had an Indigenous woman, a Mi'kmaq woman that year, organizing the whole Nocturne Festival. But she was able to choose who she wants to to kind of lead projects. And she chose me, she reached out to me. I, I hadn't met her before. And she reached out to me and she said, I would like you to do something on environmental racism. 
And I thought about an interesting idea of bringing together a community activist with an artist, right? So you see, you see in blue there, Irvin Carvery, the man on the right of my screen, and it says Africville on his shirt. So he's a longtime Africville activist since the, yeah, I mean, he's in the seventies now, he's been doing it a long time. He loves his community. So how can I pair Irvin with the poet, with the Mi'kmaq spoken word artist? That's Rebecca all the way on the left of the screen in the jean jacket, right? So it's like Irvin has five minutes to share his story about Africville. This is all on Zoom. This is the height of COVID. This is November, 2020, I believe. So we did this all on Zoom. And Irvin shares the story of Africville and immediately after Rebecca, all the way on the right, on the, on the left of the screen in the jean jacket, Rebecca, who's a, a much touted spoken word artist, has won a lot of, of awards. She then does a spoken word piece to share the story of Africville. And then I get another community activist talking about Lincolnville. And then I pair that person with a musician and so on and so forth. So is this kind of storytelling through art and through activist stories about environmental racism. I had so much fun doing this. Uh, this was well attended and the people, you know, the response we got was really incredible. And once again, this is a time of COVID, everybody's isolated. So to watch something like this uh, on Zoom, uh, I think was really engaging. And once again, it's sharing, it's sharing my findings in a different way. And I continue to work with media. Media has been good for me. It's not everybody likes media. A lot of academics don't want to speak to media. They think they're taken out of context and all that. I understand that. I would say that 80, 90% of the time media has been positive for me. It gets the word out. Um, I need to get the word out more than maybe other academics because a lot of people didn't know about environmental racism or still don't know about environmental racism. So media has helped me to get the word out and to to share this term and make it um, understandable to people who think it's a strange term and to get people on board and maybe to get volunteers and people to support. Um, and I do believe um, when I look at the trajectory over the past, I guess it's 12 years I've been doing this, this has changed the game uh, around environmental racism in terms of awareness and people now starting to do their own work on environmental racism. That wasn't happening when I started. Um, and I was being added to events as the sustainability person, um, squeezing me into sustainability talks. I don't see environmental racism within the realm of sustainability. It's its own specific thing. It's about racism. So people were squeezing me into other things and that changed. And then I also have professors who reach out to me saying, oh, I'm holding an event on environmental racism. I'm like, this is shocking to me. That wasn't happening 12 years ago. They were holding events on sustainability. And maybe environmental racism was the exotic piece that they brought to it. But so many professors have reached out to me across Canada. I'm doing an event on environmental racism. Students saying to me, I want to get into environmental racism. Can you suggest what master's degree I should do in order to do what you're doing? Because they don't necessarily want to do the pollutant thing. They don't want to do the environmental science thing. They want to do this, right? So they want to know from me what, what's the best degree they should get. Is it sociology or is it environmental studies or... So um, media, I think, has helped with all of that. Um, research, of course, I'm a professor. I have to do research. Most of it, all of it has been community engaged. Um, I've done a lot of it, but the one that I'm working on right now that I find very interesting is looking at Shelburne as a case study uh, because they have, as I said, high rates of cancer, high rates of multiple myeloma. So in August, I went down with the team to host a town hall to introduce this study that we're doing called Genes and geography disparities in cancer rates in a Black Canadian um, community. Um, this is extremely multidisciplinary. I've got a biologist by the name of um, Julia Daniel at McMaster on board. She is known for discovering this Kaiso gene in Black women that's connected to cancer. And she does work in maybe Africa, West Indies, Canada with Black women looking at cancer and race. I've got a planner slash architect on the team who looked at the dump for this study, looked at the content of the dump as well as his student. I have a statistician on board. There's a nurse on board. There's a toxicologist on board. And then I consider myself to be a sociologist. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, yeah, we know the community thinks the dump is the problem for the cancer, but as responsible, so, uh, as responsible researchers, we have to look at all the issues. 
um, because multiple issues can be causing high cancer rates, not simply the dump, right? We can't just say it's the dump and, and not do the research. So we're saying, is it lifestyle factors like smoking, exercise, diet? That's number one. Is it genetics, biology, African ancestry? That's number two. Is it the content of the dump? As I said, the architect looked at the contents of the dump, the findings are there. And is it the social and structural determinants of health, which is my, my um, area, like race, gender, age, um, income? What's causing it? All of those four things, some of those four things, none of those four things, that's what we're trying to look at. So the interviews are being done right now, the focus groups, the biospecimen samples uh, being taken by the biologist, uh, Julia Daniel, and also Paola Marignani in medicine at Dalhousie. Uh, they're, they've taken or are taking biospecimen samples, blood, et cetera, uh, and testing it. And the results from those will come out in two years, unfortunately, but we will have the results from the interviews and focus groups. Of course, I have to publish as well as an academic that this is my first book, you know, the documentary is based on the first book. What I wanted to do was to just share my journey, my challenges, the, all the challenges that I experienced doing this project, doing community-based research. I think some people think community-based research is easy um, or that you're just born knowing what to do and it's harder than anything else because you're dealing with people, communities. You can, you can ruin the trust that they have in you if you mess up early on they will never forgive you um, so it's very difficult and i talk about some of the challenges i had when communities weren't ready for me i wanted to go to peak to landing first station i wasn't thinking about the fact that well maybe they don't want me there you know and the chief said to me we're not ready for you right now ingrid a lot of dalhousie professors are coming here doing their surveys and we are burnt out uh, we don't want you yet <laughs> it was hurtful but I had to put on my researcher cap and say, she's right. I have to read the temperature of the community. It's not about when I wanna go, it's when they want me to go. And I know I have ethics to do and I need to do this project and there's a deadline, but it's not about me, right? So in that, in a particular chapter on community-based research, I talk about that, mostly for students and people who wanna do this type of research that it's not about you, it's about the community. You gotta take the temperature. Do they want you? Not necessarily. Uh, so, yeah, the trip ups that I've made and the ways I try to address them. I put that in the book. I talk about my journey just doing the whole project. I talk about the community members and the achievements they've made over the years and the challenges that they've had as well. And then in chapter five is my my health chapter. The last chapter is government. What can government be doing? What should they be doing better? Um, Community capacity building has also been important. I don't want to be the kind of academic that goes into communities, takes leaves, never returns. So I made a commitment to developing skills in the community, um, many types of skills so that they can fly. I always say they can fly on their own. They don't need me to hold their hands. What I, I have to admit that I do bring to the communities are money, if I have a grant, networks. I'm at a university. My networks are, you know, I know of environmental scientists and environmental studies professor. I know everyone. So I can bring those networks to them and I can bring certain skills, literature and all of that. But once you bring that to the communities, you've given them a capacity to fly on their own. And I think a perfect example of that is Shelburne and Louise DeLille, who's in the film. Um, I see it, I saw it, I, you know, I came in and I gave certain skills, I gave certain things. And after that, she took the lead on everything. And she would say, oh, other people help me, Ingrid. She's modest, she'll say, it's not just me, but the leadership that she has shown when she's gotten those things, she now has the network. She knows who to talk to in government. All of those things are, for me, community capacity building. Um, one of the ways that we build capacity is by doing the testing projects, the water testing projects. Um, first in Lincolnville and then in Shelburne. We knew that both communities wanted, wanted their water tested. They didn't want the government to do it. They didn't trust the government. We, you know, I got together a small group, uh, an environmental scientist, more specifically a hydrogeologist, an environmental science professor, an environmental science student, I think she was from University of Waterloo, and another student to do a profile on the communities. And we did this at no cost. That was the whole point, that these communities don't have the money to pay anybody to do water testing. 
but they have been concerned about contamination and they didn't know what's what's what was in their water and we were able to do that. So the environmental science professor used his lab, of course, at no cost and tested the water over the summer. I forgot how many hours he gave to that to that work, but it was a lot of hours. We did a profile on the community. We got some maps from uh, the Department of Environment of Nova Scotia. We did some other stuff. We went to the community, went back to the community with the findings, uh, spoke to them about how to manage their drinking water supply. And this was a successful project. Um, we built capacity. We showed them how to test their own water. How many of us know how to do that? <laughs> None of us probably, right? But we do know that in rural communities, probably in Canada, but I just know about Nova Scotia, the water, most rural communities are on well water. They're not on municipal water. So well water tends to be more contaminated. Um, so after those projects were successful, we thought this is a fantastic blueprint for a new NGO. Because uh, this project in Lincolnville, the water testing was done in um, in the fall of uh, 20, in the summer of 2016. The next year we said, this really worked out well. Uh, we think we should create an NGO and we did. And what you see on the screen is the logo for Rural Water Watch. And um, what we do is we do water testing in rural Nova Scotian communities. We happen to do the projects in black communities but we're not focused on just black communities. As long as you are rural in Nova Scotia, um, we will test your water at no cost. Even though I returned to Ontario, I'm still checking in with Fred Bonner, who's the hydrogeologist and also the president now, um, to find out what he's doing and what's happening. And he keeps going. Um, one of the things that we've done before I left was an annual, in October, an annual well water day. And this is about educating Nova Scotians about the need to keep their wells healthy, because an unhealthy well can lead to health issues. So if you have a cracked well, an old well, most people don't know about this, right? They don't know about the wells and you know how long you should keep it and whether or not if it's cracked, if that's a risk. So it's about educating people online, on social media, as well as in person about how to keep their wells healthy. Online, we use infographics and posters and statistics and we just share knowledge. On site, we choose four or three communities that we're gonna focus on and we ask them to bring in their water on a particular day, the water is tested and the results are then shared with the community. So I really think this is a, I'm really proud of this NGO because it's tangible. Um, it's nice to have a book, but <laughs> does that do anything for the community? I guess it, it it educates them about environmental racism, but what they really want is no contamination, no pollution, right? So something like this that's tangible, um, that we're working for communities is something that I'm most proud of. I've only recently got into climate change. I never really knew where I fit. Um, I always saw climate change as the domain of a climate scientist and I'm in no way a climate scientist. And I didn't like the messaging either. I didn't feel that it was broken down in a way that allowed me to think about what I could do. And the messaging always seemed the same. You gotta do this before 2030. You gotta do this and for me and other people, and I'm educated. <laughs> So I was confounded, like, what, what do you want me to do? And why is this important? And is this a priority? And I felt the messaging was off. And there was a part of me, I started to read articles on climate justice and thought that something was missing. Climate justice is about, well, there's not a one size fits all approach to climate change. People are impacted differently. Some people are much more vulnerable than, than others. And I felt that climate scientists weren't talking about that. They were saying that we all should do this at this time. But what if you can't, right? So when I started reading about climate justice, I realized that racialized communities, indigenous communities are more vulnerable to climate change impacts, just like with environmental racism. So while many people wanna present climate change as, oh, we're all impacted, yeah, we are, uh, but some are much more impacted than others, and why? And I realized it's because of race, it's because of colonialism, it's because of access to resources or lack of access, it's because of the lack of networks that some people have. It's about where you live. If you have a disability and you're elderly, you have compounding factors that make it difficult for you, for example, to evacuate. I realized that these social identities that some people might say um, is just creating more problems or is identity politics. I say, I guess it is identity politics, but it's real. We do have to look at the intersections of race and culture and class and poverty and gender disability, age, 
because all of those issues shape people's experiences of climate change. It shapes their ability to ward off climate change. It shapes their ability to come out of, to survive, to address climate change. And I didn't find that was being spoken of by climate scientists. So when I read this work, I said, I see where I fit now. As a sociologist, I do have a part to play just like I did in environmental racism when I didn't think I had a part to play. So this is my angle. I am not a climate scientist. I can't tell you anything about pollutants. If anybody wants to ask me questions later on about that, I'm not your person. The only thing I can talk about is climate justice. And I can talk about disproportionality and vulnerability and also making climate change relevant to communities. So right now I'm doing uh, two projects, one in Nova Scotia, one in the GTHA with black communities only. We're doing workshops. We're getting them acquainted with the topic. We wanna know what they know about climate change. We wanna know about its impacts. And we wanna know how they may be more vulnerable. Um, and then we're going to take the results. We're going to create a policy, a policy report, a climate policy report on developing relationships with policymakers. I want to see these communities have a seat at the table. Um, they're not going to come out of these workshops as experts or climate experts, but I want them to feel ready and able to sit with anyone to talk about how this impacts their community and their suggestions and ideas. We're doing a video, like a documentary based on the workshops. And we're gonna produce some fact sheets as well and different types of knowledge translation uh, resources. I do a lot of environmental education. I've mentored a lot of students. What has surprised me doing this project is how interdisciplinary the topic of environmental racism is. I didn't know that, but then when I was at Dalhousie, I had students from sociology, the law school, the medical school, political science, environmental science, environmental studies, nursing, all came to me because they wanted an experience of meeting with community members. They're sitting in their classes, learning about environmental racism, but never had a chance to meet the impacted people. And because I had already developed those relationships because I had driven down to those communities, I provided through my Enrich project, an avenue through which to create those relationships. So I had a lot of students doing experiential courses or placement courses, and they chose my organization to do it. And I just noticed that they came from every discipline. Um, and then I realized, yeah, well, everybody has like a little bit of a stake in all of this. You know, the law students are interested in the legislation and the policy. And of course, the health students are interested in the health part. And the international studies development students are interested in the health part as well, and also the legislation. I saw that everybody had a bit of a stake. Um, so this has been thrilling for me. Thrilling for me because I've also learned from the students and I've learned from professors in different departments. and. I never see a problem with somebody who's in an extremely different discipline than I am coming on board because I've learned so much. And I now realize that the solution to any problem, not just environmental racism, is interdisciplinary connections, uh, people not staying in their silos. This is something that has actually highlighted that for me, this project, that the solution is interdisciplinary. Because when I think about all the people, the disciplines, the professors who have come to me, and they have different solutions, different takes on issues, I've learned from that. And I'm doing a curriculum project right now. How do we embed environmental racism and the experiences of the black community in Windsor, Essex, Ontario into the curriculum? Because they have a lot of issues around flooding, environmental racism, but they're not seeing it in the high school curriculum. How can we embed it? I'm working with an organization, an educational organization led by uh, a black man, Kenny, and he approached me about doing this. Um, so changing the curriculum, anti-racist curriculum, but anti-racism cur curriculum with an environmental spin that looks at urban planning, climate change, environmental racism, gentrification in the Black community in Windsor, Essex, and in the Black Canadian community more broadly, how do we embed it in the curriculum? Legal remedies, I've worked with eco-justice. Um, they are all over Canada, well, not all over Canada, but they have offices in Vancouver and Toronto, Calgary, as far as I know. And then 2018, they came to, they opened up um, an office in Halifax. I was still in Halifax in 2018. I went down to the office. I met with the lawyers and I said, here are the communities I'm working with. I just want to tell you about them. And they started working with many of those communities because they were new and, you know, they didn't really know the the lay of the land as yet and uh, they continue to work with the communities all of that is private and confidential so I don't necessarily know what is happening unless I ask and I reach out to a community member for permission 
uh, to know. So that's all I can say about that. What I'm really interested in is getting legislation passed. I've been trying to do this in Nova Scotia, provincially with an environmental racism bill. The first one being Bill 111 that was uh, sponsored by Lenore Zan, who's no longer a politician. And since 2015, L Lenore put that environmental racism private members bill forward in the Nova Scotia legislature. Never happened. It went to second reading, went no further. She then switched over to the federal party as a MP, liberal. And just before COVID hit in 2020, I think it was February, she reached out to me and she said, you know that old Nova Scotia private members bill, why don't we turn that into a federal bill? And I said, of course, then we can deal with all the instances of environmental racism across Canada, particularly pipelines and in indigenous communities. So she, we both modified the bill. So I would say that I helped develop this bill. Um, a lot of it came from my book. You know, So the first iteration of this bill, the Nova Scotia bill came from a 15 page report I sent Lenore based on my book. And I said, you need to use this and you need to use these terms, et cetera. Um, when we changed the bill to a federal bill, we kind of made it a little bit more robust. We admit that the first iteration of the bill was soft. We didn't want to scare people. This was at a time when people were saying environmental racism, what's that? Right? So we didn't want to scare people off. But with this federal bill, it was harder. We want reparations. We want financial compensation to the communities impacted. We want you to do a study that looks at the links between race, socioeconomic status, toxic risks, and health. This that wasn't in the first in the first iteration of the bill. This is a little bit harder. Um, or rougher or robust, I guess I would say more robust. I'm very, very happy to say that, um, you know, we did turn into a federal bill. It was introduced in December of 2020. And then we know that a snap election was called, right, in 2021 in September. And whenever that happens, all private members' bills die on the order paper. So I was with Lenore and I was like, what now then? You know, we've been doing this since 2015 and now the bill is gone. And then we heard that Elizabeth May wanted to reintroduce it. Uh, so we are so happy. This is a smart woman. Um, and she's done work. She's done work in Nova Scotia uh, around Cape Breton uh, and the environmental racism issue there that I guess was in the 1980s. So I said to Elizabeth, yes, I spoke with her. She said, are you going to support me? I said, I have another organization. We can do campaigns. We can do all this. I'm definitely going to support you. So she introduced it in February of 2022. It went through very nicely through Parliament, just like it did with Lenore. Um, and then I'm now happy to say it's at Senate. This is a dream come true. This is something I've wanted since I was in Nova Scotia and looking at this provincially. So two weeks ago, um, so in March, it moved to Senate. And two weeks ago, I looked at the video, the, the live video, and the speaker, I guess it's the conservative speaker, I forgot his name. Said, I think it's Plett, Senator Plett, talked about how he doesn't like the bill. He's not for it. He sees so many problems with it, but he's going to let it move to third reading, I believe. So that was second reading. Um, McCallum stood up as well, and she spoke to it. But he said, don't like the bill. Don't think the government can do this. I think it's too much. It's too broad. The scope is too big. It's not detailed enough. But I'm going to give it a chance and let it move through. So it was voted uh, to third reading. If this passes a third reading. I'm not too up on the process. I find it very confusing. But then it gets royal assent. And if it gets royal assent, I believe it then becomes law. So this has a chance right now to become the first environmental racism legislation slash law in Canada. That pleases me very much after trying to work on this for, what, since 2015? To see this maybe being realized is is exciting, but I also think it has a chance to make some real changes. Maybe not, who knows, but it's a step forward, certainly. And I'm creating national partnerships, you know, now beyond Nova Scotia, now that I'm back in Ontario, I've been back for two years teaching at McMaster. Um, I must go beyond Nova Scotia, obviously. So I've been building those partnerships across Canada. And one of the reasons why too is that, um, there's an opportunity to connect with someone <laughs> to do consultations across Canada for a new environmental justice strategy. I'm not gonna, okay. So it's the government, it's the department, federal department of environment. They are doing a new national environmental justice strategy, the first ever in Canada. Uh, it requires consultations with impacted communities across Canada. They need to find an organization that has those connections. That organization thankfully is my organization that I co-founded after Enrich, called the Canadian 
Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice. So I have the Enrich project I created in 2012, but in 2020, I created this new organization with Nalo Charles, who resides in Toronto, to bring together civil society organizations like David Suzuki, all the name people that you know, uh, environmental defense. We share resources and skills and knowledge to address environmental racism and climate change across Canada. Uh, the, the Federal Department of Environment has chosen our organization. They were considering others and we're, we're just three years old. This is something that Nal and I talked about on Zoom when we first met for this coalition. We said, wouldn't it be great if we had good relationships with the, with the government, particularly the Department of Environment? Wouldn't it be great if you and I created a national strategy on environmental justice? We're not creating it, but they've chosen us to do the consultations and to help with the study on the links between, as I said, race, socioeconomic status. And also another phase of this is awareness raising. Just because environmental racism is happening, for example, in an indigenous community, doesn't mean that that indigenous community knows what environmental racism is, right? They know this is happening, but not everybody has a name for it. Um, and they don't necessarily know what it means. So we need to do a lot of awareness raising in impacted communities, not assuming that they know what this environmental racism term means, all of what it means. So we will be involved in this for the next three years um, with the government. This is a dream come true. This is what we talked about back in 2020. Um, I have a few calls to action, but I want to kind of move to final words because this is a topic that I realize is very doom and gloom, and I like to leave people with a bit of um, bit of hope uh, by sharing what has happened and the the achievements that actually have been made over, I guess, the past ten years uh, that I've seen. So I'm going to share uh, some of those with you right now. So the legacy, the legacy of struggle, opposition, and resistance against environmental racism in Canada has led to several wins in recent years. At the end of 2016, the South End Environmental Injustice Society in Shelburne, founded by Louise DeLille and other members of the African Nova Scotian community in Shelburne and their allies, succeeded in closing the landfill. In addition, in the spring of 2020, Elliot Page gifted the community with a well, which is in the process of being installed. Last year, the South End Environmental and Justice Society brought their case to the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission for the various forms of racism that they've experienced as a Black community that includes environmental racism, but includes a whole host of other issues and insults from um, the town council and disregard from the town council. So they brought their case to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, on January 31st, 2020, Northern Pulp Mill finally closed after the Nova Scotia government announced in 2019, I must add, two months after the film screened at TIFF, coincidence, that the mill had failed to produce an alternate plan for its wastewater treatment and ordered the mill to close end of January. In October, 2021, Seven years after the project began, Alton Gas announced that they had decided to cancel the Alton Gas Brine Discharge Pipeline Project in Sabaganagany First Nation, stating that with the sale of the Nova Scotia utility, the repositioning of the business and the challenging nature of the storage project e economics, Alta Gas had decided not to continue with the development of Alton of the Alton Gas Brine Discharge pipeline and to move forward with decommissioning the project. While the former residents and descendants of Africville have yet to obtain redress, they continue to make demands for reparations uh, heard. In November 2016, up to 300 former residents of Africville and their descendants joined an application submitted to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia for a class action lawsuit against the city of Halifax over the loss of their land four decades ago. The application was turned down by the judge in 2018, who ruled that the plaintiff had not satisfied the requirements to certify the class action, preventing the case from proceeding. 
Africville descendants continue to fight and to make their voices heard. However, in 2020, they marched through the streets of Halifax demanding reparations and a few months later, um, and that hasn't happened yet. I don't think they were heard or there was much response uh, by different levels of government. Uh, but if you're interested in Africville, a fantastic podcast, um, a podcast series was produced by Alfred, I think his name is Alfred Bertinson, who lives in Halifax. Uh, it's titled Africville Forever. I believe it's on Apple or, yeah, you can easily find it um, on the internet. And you will hear from the activists like Irvin Carvery and his brother and, you know, from the 1960s, what has happened and uh, all the challenges that this particular community has had over the years trying to get reparations uh, for the loss of their land four decades ago. I, I do believe they will rise again because they keep rising again, you know, first in 2016, again in 2020. I'm not sure what's next, but we will hear from them again. Whether or not they get redress, I don't know, but I believe they will. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, and I don't know if there's time for questions, but happy to take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Waldron. Thank you for offering uh, words of uh, naming the realities as well as offering some hope. Um, there is time for questions. So far, there have not been any questions raised in the chat. Um, people have been, um, uh, you know, naming outrage with the, the realities that you've named, uh, have offered affirmation from your books. Some people have read your book or seen the documentary and, and noted how, how, how excellent it is. Um, there was some sharing in the chat around um, some of the legislative pieces that you had talked about, um, as well as people naming some other communities uh, where injustices are happening. So certainly lots of resonance with people and engagement with what you've said. Um, so far, no questions, though. Uh, if there are any questions, um, please feel free to, to note those in the chat. Um, yeah. A lot of information to take in. I realize that. <laughs> Lots have happened. <laughs> if you don't uh, have so any qu oh, questions, sorry. yeah, if you don't have any questions, feel free uh, to reach out to me by email. If at any point you're interested in joining any one of these organizations, whether it's Enrich or the Coalition, um, Please do. We're often engaged in campaigns on particular issues. Right now, there's a focus, of course, on the bill and making sure that that gets passed. But um, and if you know of people who have issues, environmental issues that they want the coalition to take on, we have a project that we just broadly call championing other environmental racism projects other than our own. So what we typically do is we support them. Of course, they lead it. We don't want to lead it because it's your project, but we can support. It could be through human resources. It could be through financial resources in the future. Um, it could be through social media or developing campaigns. So if you've got your own project, then we would champion it. So just for you to know that and people that you know to know that as well. Wonderful. Uh, so some questions have emerged in the chat here. Um, one one question is just if you'd be willing to share your slides. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So we we can add that to uh, the Church X website. Uh, I get a notation that um, found the, the the presentation deep, engaging, and educative. Um, there are two questions. So uh, one is, can you say a bit more about the value of interdisciplinary approaches? And then another question is, could you comment on why provincial health health services and doctors are so reluctant to speak out um, to do research in, in racialized communities? Uh, the first uh, first question, um, for me, I guess the interdisciplinary nature of the project has a lot to do with gaps that we all have. I realize I have gaps. I'm not an environmental scientist. My PhDs in sociology and equity studies, which of course is relevant to this, but I don't have an environmental science degree. I don't have a geography degree. These are degrees that I think lend themselves to this type of work. Um, however, I realize that I have a different slant. Like I don't want to do that work. I don't want to do the work on pollution and contamination. I'm much more focused on the people 
as a sociologist. I'm focused on the institutions, the structural inequities, the racism, colonialism, capitalism, all the things that sociologists like to talk about, but to make it real through this project to show how it actually plays out. So while I recognize my gaps, I realized that the way that I did this without having that kind of knowledge was actually the best way to approach it because I'm doing it my way in a different way. And there are lots of environmental scientists who are doing the work that they do. I, I didn't find anybody doing the work that I was doing in Nova Scotia. The activists, yes, um, but researchers, I, I felt like the lone wolf. Some people might contest that, but I, I didn't meet anybody. And in fact, um, I found it difficult to find professors to be on teams. Um, the people I found to be on my team were people who were not professors. So I didn't find professors who were doing the work I was doing. I mean, certainly work similar in environmental studies. Um, yeah, but the people who are my teams tended to be activists, community leaders, and maybe the hydrogeologist who wasn't a professor, who wasn't teaching, but had his own organization. So I felt very alone in Nova Scotia doing this work. Um, but I realized now that it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I could have been swayed by other approaches that are already being done. And I did it in my way, I would say, in my way, in my own unique way. So yes, it's I, but I did see the value of bringing on different people. At a certain point, I said to myself, when people come into my office, and they want to meet with me because they have a different slant on this, or they think I should try this. I always listen to them. And that was the hydrogeologist. He went to that event that I showed you on screen. He was sitting in the audience. He called me up and said, I want to meet with you. He came into my office and he said, love it. Love your event last night. It was great. Love the fact that you're doing the legislation. That's great. But don't you think you should give the communities a tangible win? Which kind of got me a bit upset, but I kept my mouth closed. I said, what do you mean by a win? I'm doing this and I got kind of defensive. I said, I'm doing the legislation. I'm doing this. Like, what else? I don't know what you mean. He said, well, something tangible that they can take home with them. Like, I'm not dismissing the event. It was wonderful. I'm not saying anything about the legislation. That's wonderful too, but something that's more of a win. And he said, what about testing their water? And I said, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist. I don't know anything about that. He said, well, I am a hydrogeologist and I know everything about it. And I'm happy to come on board and to build a little team and we can give a community a win. We can tell them what's in their water for the very, very first time. And by telling them that they will now know how to manage it. Now, I could have said no, because this was out of my realm. And maybe I could have said to myself, I'm not interested in that. And I was smart enough to say yes, because it ended up being one of the best projects, as I said, that I have, and we turned it into an NGO. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of. So I learned early on that when people said to me, and many people wanted to meet with me in my office to kind of give me a food for thought or a different approach, and I started saying yes to everybody. That's tiring. I, I, I didn't have a lot of time. I don't do it as much anymore because of time, but I said to myself, I'm just going to say yes to everybody. And I Every time somebody came into my office and I, you know, I said yes to them, come to my office, they gave me something to think about and a different road to walk down. And just when I thought my project was ending in certain places that maybe I need to move on to something else, it kept the project going because they had, had a different viewpoint and they ultimately came from a different discipline, a discipline that was not my own, that I didn't really understand, that I'd never worked with. And they added something to the project. They either made it more tangible or they allowed me to see things in a different way. Um, so I really believe in interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work because it addresses my own gaps that I know that I have. Uh, but it also brings a different spin on the projects. And I do believe, as I said, that the solution to every problem, not just environmental racism, is interdisciplinary work and not stay, staying within your silos. And we do that. And this is how we are brought up you know, you're in psychology, you're in environmental science, you're in this, and pretty much professors, scholars who are in those disciplines like to work with many of them, not all of them, like to work with other people in their discipline, people that they can understand. And if you're very different, vastly different, like me, maybe in health or sociology, sometimes you just don't fit with them. They want people in their field. Um, but I've just chosen to do it differently because I saw the benefits in my project. Um, the other question was about, what was it? Um, 
administration? Um, the other the other question was, uh, could you comment on why provincial health services sure. and doctors are so reluctant to speak out or to do research in racialized communities? I don't know if it's reluctance. I don't know what it is. I just know that I, I uh, wanted to work with Nova Scotia Health, which is not really government. There's the Nova Scotia Department of Health, which is government, and then Nova Scotia Health. And that work started a bit when one of the diversity coordinators, there's like five of them across the region, reached out to me probably in 2016 and said, we want to start with some webinars. The webinars were successful. We had like, I guess, 90 people on that webinar. I introduced people to environmental racism. And then I found it's kind of stopped. Um, I, I don't know if people think this is off the side of their desk. Uh, it's work that they're not mandated to do. It's additional work. So I don't, I can't really say, but I found it a struggle to get people, it's not even about me, just to get them to understand that environmental issues is a health issue. So when you talk about the social and structural determinants of health, you should also be talking about the ecological determinants of health. That's never factored in. It's not even about working with people. It's more about their conceptualizations of health. Uh, environment never gets in there. It's always about poverty, which it should be as structural determinants of health, poverty, housing, transit. But it seems like people don't understand that the ecological determinants of health, environmental issues, toxins and poisons and pollutants, to me, is an obvious aspect of health. Um, there was an environmental department or section of the health department. Then that moved out of the health department and it went to the Nova Scotia Department of Environment. So it was taken out of the health department. And then when I contacted the Department of Environment, I asked if anybody was doing anything on health and they said no, right? So siloing health from environment, siloing environment from, and I was like, I don't know who to go to provincially or in terms of government because it's all siloed or is moved out of. So that's a kind of indication that they don't see health and environment as things that go together. And even though I knew nothing about the environment when I started my project, I knew immediately that it was a health issue, right? Because I thought, cancer, cancer. I don't want to live near a dump because I'm scared of cancer. I probably didn't know anything at that point, but that's what I thought immediately. And I think that's what most people think. So if somebody said to any of you, do you want this landfill in your neighborhood? All of you would probably say no, because you're probably thinking cancer. There's just the idea of, I just don't want it in my community. There's that too. I just don't want this thing near me. But I think most of you will say it's because could it cause, cause cancer? Which it, I think it does to a certain extent. So obviously a health issue, but yeah, I think the way in terms of universities, the way they teach health, I was in health, I was teaching in nursing, I was in the faculty of health, uh, just a few of us doing environmental health. Um, when you go to environmental studies, environmental science, from what I gather, they're not really teaching health. They're also not teaching a community-based approach to a large extent. So I would have students from international development studies, environmental science come to me in my office and say, I've come to you because I want to meet the community members and I know that you develop relationships with them. And I've come to you because I also want to talk about health and I want to talk about climate refugees and I want to talk about race and I want to talk about all these things. And I'm like, isn't that what you're being taught? And they were like, no, they're not being taught those things in the other. So they would come to me, somebody who doesn't really have the experience in their discipline to teach them things. You know, I'm not in an international development studies. I'm not in environmental science. And so I always felt kind of inconfident. Can I give them what they want? But they didn't want what they already knew, which was environmental science. They're in environmental science. They wanted the capitalism and the colonialism and the racism. They were hungry for it. I was surprised, you know? I mean, these, these were white students mainly. And I always think, oh, white students don't want me to talk about race because in nursing, they didn't. <laughs> they told me they didn't. So I was brainwashed. I thought white students don't want me to talk about race. These were students who wanted me to talk. They had a hunger for it. They wanted to know about it because they weren't learning about it in their class. So there's just something we need to do, I think. For me, the answer is um, that we need to hire more environmental sociologists. I think I'm biased, I'm a sociologist, but when I think of the departments that I know of, I don't think they're environmental sociologists who are bringing the race aspect and the colonialism. You see that in the United States. There's lots of environmental sociologists being hired by universities. But when I think about the universities I've worked in and I look at their bios, they're not environmental sociologists. They're climate scientists, they're environmental scientists. If they were environmental sociologists, you would be able to tell from their bios. 
So that's to me, one way to address this gap is to bring in people who have other perceptions, conceptualizations of the environment so that students can learn from them. So that they don't, students don't have to come to me uh, to get this. I would like them to get it from their own departments. Although I'm happy, I'm happy to meet these students because once again, I've learned from them, so. Great. Um, there are three more questions in the chat if you're willing to engage those ones. Sure. Uh, one is what happens when indigenous or racialized communities need to move out of, of their communities because of environmental issues. So what happens, what's the process? Um, another question is a wondering if you have done any work with Bruce Jackson, who is with Keepers of the Water in Athabasca, um, and then noting that it would be great to see you work together. Um, and the last question is, in Chalk River, Ontario, the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nations fight the planned above surface nuclear waste facility against powerful nuclear indus industry representatives. And they re received um, no free prior informed consent. Uh, and so the Algonquins fought against this for over 15 years. So we're wondering if that's environmental racism. Take the last one first because I recently had somebody approach me about something similar, but it didn't fit the perfect description of environmental racism. But the issue of duty to consult was central, and I said to them, and I think of the fish. Remember the fisherman issue in Nova Scotia three years ago. Um, the environmental activists that I know who are activists around environmental racism went to fight that as well because they realized they recognized immediately that while. May not be a test case of environmental racism. The whole issue of duty to consult and who owns this land or water was central. So I think um, with environmental racism, it's important, maybe not too much, but to expand the definition at times beyond polluting industries. Now, there are people who expand it too much. So I've heard from people who say anti-Black police violence is environmental racism. <laughs> And I get what they're saying. I just don't like it because I think once we start expanding it to anti-Black racism and to, you know, shoplifting, you know, accusing Black people of shoplifting in a store because it happens in the environment, I guess, then we go too far. Then we, we obscure the real issue of environmental racism and pollution and contamination. So I do understand the need to expand a bit, but I don't want it to expand too much. But with this particular issue that you just, that you just mentioned, um, I think... When we talk about duty to consult, it's one of the major definitions of environmental racism. As I mentioned, the fifth tenet is participatory democracy, uh, having a seat at the table, allowing, enabling impacted communities to have their say, uh, to make sure that they're involved in decision making. When we think of duty to consult, um, that's part of it. Um, it may not be a case of pollution, contamination, although it is. It's something that people don't want. It's an industry, a project that is seen as negative, that communities don't want, who have a right to say that they don't want it. So maybe not a classic case of environmental racism, but it's also when I talk about you know somebody who recently approached me with something similar, I'm thinking about whether or not I should take it on in the project that I mentioned, which is called Championing Other People's Projects. I need to discuss that with my co-founder because he has to say yes as well but it's not a shut in case case of environmental racism they were concerned about that they said this is probably not environmental racism I, I don't know if we should care that much I think the duty to consult is enough in a way for us to provide support and also you know with with my organization the climate C Canadian coalition of climate justice we also recognize that all these things are intersecting issues um, that there's environmental racism that intersects with climate change, that intersects with urban planning issues like transit. All these things are interconnected in our worlds, ultimately. So we, when we set up the coalition, we said we need to look at all of these things inclusive, inclusively. We do want to focus on climate change and environmental racism, but urban planning and transit and food security and poverty and health are connecting issues. So can I... Can I really just say no to people who have concerns that you just expressed? Probably not, because I I, I value the intersectionality. Um, the other question was... Um, um, <clears throat> what a question was, a do you know question. Do you know um, 
Bruce Jackson, who is with Keepers of the Water in Athabasca. And just a, a, a shout out saying that um, the person's naming that yeah. it would be wonderful if you wanted to work together. I don't think his name rings a bell, but the organization does, the group does, mm -hmm. very much. Great. Yes. Uh, and the, the, the last question was around what happens if Indigenous or racialized communities need to move out um, of where they are because of environmental issues? So what happens? What's the process? They sometimes don't. I could be wrong, but I can pose this another way. There are people who say, well, why don't they pose it a different way? If they're so unhappy and they're living near to a landfill, why do they stay? And I talk a little bit about this in the in the book. Yeah, if you're affluent, rich, you can leave. You have the ability to leave. Uh, you have the means to leave. Uh, there are various reasons why these communities don't leave. Number one, it's their home. It's like asking somebody to leave their home. Yes, there are health issues. Yes, it's scary. But you're asking somebody to leave their home. And number two, do they have the ability to leave? Do they have the money to leave uh, Shelburne and go to Halifax where it may appear safer and have the money to buy a new home? Not necessarily. I mean, some people who leave are the young people. So in Lincolnville, um, James Desmond uh, said, oh, the young people have left, they're migrating out. But it's not only about the landfill, it's about they're looking for other opportunities. That was happening around 2009, where a lot of people were leaving Nova Scotia, people in their 20s, young people in their 20s, 25, 26, were leaving for Calgary because there are opportunities uh, in in Calgary, they were leaving for Toronto. I remember a lot of young people were talking about that. There was an article about that, that people in that age group were leaving. So a lot of young people left Lincolnville. Lincolnville is now an elderly community where there's the, the economic base is faltering. Why? Because, because the elderly are not working. They're retired, right? People also don't want to build homes there because they heard about the landfill. They don't want to open up businesses. So the economy is faltering there. You've got an elderly community, a black community, and other communities that are that are not working. They're not in the employment sector anymore. So they have problems because of that. The young people left because they're looking for opportunities in other parts of Canada, other parts of the world. Um, but, but when people say, well, why don't they leave? Um, I don't think they consider so many issues, most of which is about poverty and income. And it's not that easy to leave. Some have chosen to stay to fight, you know, like Louise. I mean, Louise sent me an email a few days ago. She said, this person died. And she said to me, I hate this place. And it's the first time I heard her say that because she loves Shelburne. I mean, I know she didn't mean it, but she said, I hate this place. Why? Because she's seen people die all, all the time, right? Close people. But that tells you her commitment to Shelburne. She's saying that. We all say things like, oh, I just hate this place. Everybody's always dying. She doesn't really mean it. But she's sick and tired of seeing it. That's the emotional, psychological toll. But she doesn't want to leave. It's, uh, Shelburne is so part of her. It's so embedded. She's the fighter. She's the one who has taken much of this environmental stuff that she didn't know about when I met her. She said, environmental racism, what's that? And look what she's done since then. And also people depend on her. And I know it's become part of her personality now, just who she is as a person, that she has to fight for her community. She wanted to retire. She's retirement age. She wanted to retire a few years ago. And I said, didn't you retire? And she just laughed. <laughs> she laughed at me. <laughs> She's back in now, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think before people say, why don't you leave? I think you have to understand all those complex issues that people, this is, this is where people live. They kind of love it. They love where they live as we all do. They want to stay. They want to see it get better. Uh, but for some people, they don't have the means financially. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the questions. And um, um, perhaps and uh, there are lots of notes in the chat around uh, thanks and appreciation. Lots um, People learned a lot, found it really interesting and engaging, and so uh, are very thankful for you. So, um, so with that, we'll move to, uh, I think, to closing. Um, if there are any final words that you'd like to share, uh, please feel free. Um, but we are very thankful for uh, the time that you spent with us today. Is there anything else you want to say in terms of closing? I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've talked your air off, I know. Sorry. When, no, I, get it, when I get into it, I don't stop. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was great. It was great. It, we, it was, we're very thankful for, for all that you've shared today. Thank you very, very Thank much. Thank you, everyone.
Um, yes, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we are um, we we're going to bring this part of the evening to a close. Um, when you press the leave button, there'll be a very short survey that pops up. Uh, so we invite you to complete that four question survey um, when it comes. Uh, would also invite you to come back next week. Um, there's a, a new topic next week. We'll be exploring sharing our stories, Indigenous identity in the Christian church. And there's leadership from um, um, Indigenous leaders from the Anglican Church and from the United Church. So it'll be an ecumenical gathering. So please feel free to join us next week. And thank you all for being here. And uh, please feel free to fill out the survey and continue to engage with the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. Thank you very much, everyone, and take good care. Bye-bye.